So we were talking about the four ways we bring glory to God. Now, I want to characterize these four things. The four ways we bring glory to God, these are the categories. And then the next Sunday, I'm going to end this series, but I'm going to give us the practical ways in these categories. So I'm going to give us an example of each practical thing we can do every day that represents one of these four ways that we worship God. One of these four ways that we glory God. Remember, the end of our lives, we want to be glorifying God in all of these ways. If we're only one way, that's fine. If you're two ways, that's even great. If you're three ways, hallelujah. If you're at the four things that you do, if you do all four of these things to glorify God, then you are what you call a mature Christian in Christ and and I want to applaud you but those that are not if you only have one or two or three your job your goal is to become a complete what does Paul say when I was a child I thought of the child but now that I'm a old grown person I no longer think in child's way we go from milk to meat we go into spiritual maturity God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spiritual truth so this is called spiritual maturity and as you grow in God you will become wiser you will become stronger but more than anything you will have the desire to want to be pleasing to God, to want to glorify God in all that you do. I'm going to give us some practicalities next week where we talk about when you wake up in the morning, when you're brushing your teeth. I'm going to break it down into you actually which when we're at work. Oh, I'm so bad at work. That one's going to hurt me bad. And then we talked about in our relationships and in our friendships. And so all the practice, when we go to bed, when we're getting ready for work, when we're putting on our clothes, there's some of us that we get up in the morning and we don't even acknowledge God. We don't even thank him for waking us up. And it's just going to teach you the practicality, the simplicity of the things that you make habitual in your life where you no longer take your life for granted, where you wake up thanking God for another day. And I know I love the way Dee always puts on her face before Father, as she starts out, I thank you for another day of rising up uh, she's glorifying God and and she may know that she's doing that but she may not but it's something that is in her because she is truly grateful and so as we close out this series of all that we do brings glory to God we learn about God's glory we learn that our number one thing in this whole world it's not the gifts it's not the talents it's not the service it's how we glorify God how we glorify him with our mouth how we glorify him with our actions how we glorify him in our body how we glorify him in our spirit and how he's constantly receiving glorification from us this shows that we are in a place of humility we are in a place of, of reverence we are in a place of relationship. We are aligned with God for his purpose for our life. And we accept that as a living being created in his image that was designed to bring him glory. And there is no other honor that we have than that. And that is our priority. That is our main focus. Before anything else, before our job, before an earthly relationship, before our wives, before our children, before our bank accounts, we are vessels that that bring glory to God and when we get to that place in our life I can't even tell you what kind of relationship you have you will bend but you won't break you will have moments of discouragement, but you will be encouraged because you will know that God is working in every situation and I don't have to put my head down I can stand up because I am a child of God I am resurrected into the spiritual birth of Jesus Christ so I have relationships with my father and those that are his he takes care of because I believe that by faith Therefore, I receive it by faith. And so it changes your whole life. It makes your perspective change in your whole relationship with God. You will never be the same. Never. It is transforming. It is renewing. It is invigorating. It is life changing. And it is something that you can't 
can't get around. It will ever, forever change your relationship with God. And let me tell you, it's changed my relationship with God. I never knew that God required so much glory. I never knew that God was so big. I never knew that God was so powerful. I never knew that he created everything and he intricately constructed everything and everything had a purpose. And I never seen God in such a grand scale in my life that it is mind blowing. But here's the thing. You have to believe it. You can't receive this word without faith. You can't receive the spirituality of this word without faith. It's a supernatural thing. When you talk about the universe and the galaxies and how God created, you have to believe that. Even though you're influenced with all kinds of things of this world, there is nothing that can interfere with that. That has to be a profound faith that no matter what, you are willing to die for God. Not a man, but for the God that you believe in. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh, my Elohim, and Deniah. Jehovah. And that's what our faith comes down to. Amen. And so I did the last principle, which was we bring glory to God by the way we love other believers. And now I want to do part two, which is when we are becoming Christ like we bring glory to God. When we are becoming Christ-like. So the first thing we have to do to bring glory of the four principles is we have to love our neighbors. We have to love other believers. And I, I left with a question is why as believers do we talk behind each other's back instead of confronting each other? Why do we say those things? And, and it talked about we should not do that because people will know us and they will begin to disassociate us with God and we'll begin to not look like Christ's disciples. And, and Christ warned us that not to do that, to love each other. And so the second of the principles is when we are becoming Christ-like, we bring glory to God. You see, just because you got saved doesn't mean that you're wanting to be Christ-like. Just because you got saved could be that you came to God because you was tired of uh, dealing with depression. You was tired of drug addiction. You was tired of heartbreak. But it didn't mean that you really was ready to live this life it didn't mean that you really wanted to glorify God because if you did then a lot of people that got saved would still be in church today amen and so I want to take you to 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 says this so all of us that have had the veil removed can see and reflect now stop once you've had the veil removed, that means you've received salvation. God is going to allow you to see sin for the first time. Once you receive salvation and had the veil removed, God is going to allow you to see sin for the first time. A lot of people were committing these sins and didn't know it was sin to them because the veil had not been removed. Yes, you were raised with good and bad, but some of the things that you didn't know that God did not like, you didn't know until the Holy Spirit showed you. That's called conviction. It's funny how when you get saved and you try to go do the things you used to do, you begin to not desire those things, but then when they come and you indulge in them, you feel this immediate conviction like, that's not your life no more. I don't have the same passion and, and desire or the same satisfaction I had before I got saved when I used to do those things. And that's part of the old things passing away. I don't feel the, the fulfillness of or the satisfaction how it used to make me feel when I used to go to that strip club and, and look at those women and lust after them. And so now my boy said, come on, man, let's go to the strip club again, play. You know, you got saved, but nobody knows you got saved because you're still on the down low. You know what I'm saying? It's like you don't want to come out the closet with us, so you're just trying to be on both sides. Hey, what's up? What's up, bro? Yeah, yeah, man, I'll get at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What time? 7 o'clock, we're going to be there. And then you go there and you order your drink and girl come out and, and all of a sudden... You just don't, man, I was, I was, I was into that. <laughs> she ain't doing nothing for me now. <laughs> Let me drink a little more. Another one, please. 
get, it just don't, and they all, yeah, and you're like, I, I used to do that. So all of us that have had that veil removed can see and reflect, can see and have reflection, can see and have reflection of the Lord and the Lord who is the spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed, as we are changed because we can see and we have reflection. It's like this, into his glorious image. See, it's the Holy Spirit's job to conform you to the image of Christ. But you have to be in agreement. You have to be willing to listen. You have to be willing to follow. So I love how those things begin to happen. We can't transform until we receive the gift. What's the gift? Salvation. God gets excited. Have you ever seen God get excited? No. You wouldn't know if he was excited. So I'm going to tell you, he gets excited when we show spiritual growth. Oh, my gosh. I can see him now. Ooh, come here, Jesus. Look at Vanessa. She's on meek now. She's no longer sucking on that baby bottle. She got the A1 and the steak knife, and she got a big old ribeye. Oh, look, look. She even eat the medium rare. Ooh, she loves her steak like that. And so God gets excited. He gets excited when he sees his children growing because that's relationship. How many is married in here? Do you notice that as you go through some stuff in your marriage and you pass the decade? Because you're going to have to go through all that the first decade. We're talking about those that have been married past 10 years. It seemed like and then those are 15 years and then those that are past 20. Man, it gets better. You mature, she mature, all of a sudden we are, we have a relationship. Well, you're supposed to. Okay? Yeah, with each other. You should be not arguing over the dirty drawers on the floor no more. Okay? You should be past that. Okay? Yeah, yeah, that's in the first 10 years. Y'all get through that, and then that way you can enjoy a relationship. But what I'm saying, have you ever dated someone for a long time, and it seemed like you became a soulmate, or you became real good friends, and your relationship got stronger? This is the same thing with God. God gets excited when we show spiritual growth, a.k.a. spiritual maturity, a.k.a. conforming to the image of his son. Because it is his purpose for our lives. When we are walking and living in purpose, as T.D. Jake says, when we are living in purpose, this is called a place of purpose, and once you find your purpose, you have to live in purpose. L let me say it again. When you find your purpose, you have to live in purpose. And I'm going to tell you what your purpose is, to glorify God. Remember, don't get the purpose and the call mixed up. People all junk them together. God says, no, 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 no. First, you're going to learn how to glorify me before I glorify that call, before I glorify that gift. I've given you that gift, but it'll never be used till you learn how to bring me glory first. Because if I let that gift become powerful and you have not learned how to bring glory to me, you will bring glory to yourself. Did you think God is a dummy? No. He knows exactly what you can handle and what you can't. And so it is his purpose for our life before the gifts and before the call. Transformation is happening when we are becoming like Jesus. I always say WWJD, what will Jesus do? Transformation is becoming like Jesus and the way we think, feel, and act. Let's just, just think about that for a minute. When you are transforming into the image of Christ, it's going to change the way you think. It's going to change the way you feel. It's going to change the way you act. That's powerful, huh? Now let that reflect. Is the image of Christ that people see in your life today? Is the image of Christ that you believe that you are conforming in in your own mind, has it changed the way that you think? 
You know, you used to think gloom and doom, but now you're optimists about what's going to happen. You're optimistic about what's going to happen. Before, you used to get depressed about the littlest thing, but now you don't get that depressed no more. You know, it still bothers you, but you don't carry it for days on hand. Maybe you used to get mad about something because you just keep thinking about the situation over and over again, and it's able to have that same effect on you just like it was just yesterday, and it was three weeks ago, three months ago, three years ago. Oh, think about this, people. Are you conforming to the image of Christ, changing the way you think? Oh, what about how you feel, the real feel, the, the, the emotional part of it? When we're conforming to the image of Christ, God is changing our emotions. Now, we are emotional character, but now our emotions don't get the best of us. Our emotions don't control and dictate how we think about a situation. Remember, I taught you love is not a feeling because it was based on an experience that created an emotion about how you view things. And this is why when Christ is conforming you, when the Holy Spirit is changing you, when God gets excited because you are showing spiritual growth, he sees that you are conforming to the image of his son. And he sees that in the way you think. I once was a child, I thought as a child. He sees that in the way you feel. Faith, we're not moved by the things we see. We're not moved by the things we see. We're moved by the things that we know to be. That's called faith. So therefore, it doesn't matter what I feel like. And the way we act, we act accordingly. We act accordingly. We act where our life is bearing the fruits of the Spirit. We act in a manner of having, having some reservations about who we are. And that's how the image. And listen, when we allow when you allow the Holy Spirit to conform you to the image of Christ, God gets excited. Just to keep that in mind next time you feel that little thing on your shoulder. Uh, which one will listen to? When you listen to the one that's telling you, don't do it, dummy. Stop in the name of the Lord. Before you break his heart, think it over. See, he was just excited about you. And then you went ahead and you stopped feeling, you stopped thinking, and you started acting, and he just, oh, Lord, here they go again, Jesus. Holy Spirit, throw him a lifeline. Grab a hold of it, dummy. Two hands this time. <laughs> and he just, hmm. I'm pulling him out again of the Maury clay. His feet was on the solid ground, but he slipped into some quicksand. Mm -hmm. We're bringing him back, God, okay? And then God says, okay, you all right? Okay, let's get that. All right, get him back in that game. <laughs> no, no, go on. <laughs> but I don't want to. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. <laughs> don't you wish God could rescue you and say, you don't ever have to go back in the game? Yeah. Well, he will when you die. When you're dead. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now come on over here. Until then, all those that will live godly will suffer persecution. <laughs> go back and deal with your husband. That's persecution these days. <laughs> and so the more Christ-like character we display or become, the more glory we bring to God. Why? Because Jesus sacrificed. Listen to this. Listen to this. This is a good thing. Because Jesus sacrificed brought us back to fellowship, relationship, and covenant. And so I, was, I wanted to look up the word covenant. So I looked it up. And guess what covenant means? Covenant is an agreement which brings about relationship of commitment between God and his people. Do you know when you receive salvation, you have entered into covenant with God? God is saying, I want a relationship with you. I am a relationship pastor. That's why people don't like to come to church. Because I talk about your part of the relationship, not God's part. And it hurts. Here's what God told me. 
The reason why you're not popular, Mike, because you preach about relationship. And if you guys know me for the last six years, everything I preach, including this, is about your participation. Not judgment, not condemnation, because I don't preach that. I preach the truth about what's wrong with your part of the part that you're supposed to be doing. So let's just think. Christ is the groom, and we are the bride. So we are the wife, and he is the husband. And so if the wife ain't doing her job, that's going to affect the husband. That's called a relationship, and that's how God is. We have relationship with him through Christ. And so what I preach, I preach about what part of the relationship are you not upholding? And so people don't like that. And then I break down your excuse because I use my own life. And so I leave us with no excuse but ourselves. We have our position with God because this is what we choose. God ain't changed nothing. He's there to rescue you. He's there to deliver you. He's there to provide for you. He's there to forgive you. He's there to love you. But you don't want to do that with him. And so we back away from God and we break what? Covenant. And so when we talk about covenant, we talk about that you made an agreement which brought about a relationship of commitment. Between God and you. And so what the devil did for me for 20 years is he stole my covenant with God. This is why I can't preach nothing else. This is why I'm an end time pastor. End time ministers are not going to be popular when churches are 30, 40,000 people. End time ministers will be sought out in the end times. It's always been with the man that prophesied in front of all those thousands of people told me. The first thing he says, you will be a great man of God and you will be an end time minister. I was 12. I don't even know what the end times is. But the end times is the times where people will seek out truth. They don't want to go to a church that's going to make them feel good. They want someone to tell them the stinking truth about why you're in your situation. God delivered me, and I went right back into that, and now it's God's fault. So if I say that to you, you get all offended. But it's the truth. And then I say, well, listen, God says your flesh is going to be weak. But he says that he still loves you. He says that you're going to fall down, and you're going to get back up. But do you want to? It's another part of your relationship. Well, I'd rather just stay down there because it's, I ain't got to do anything. It's hard to live for God. And I'm going to tell you the truth. And it took me a while to get over that. Like, God, why are people, why are, why are people say you read my mail? I don't read your mail. I'm just preaching the truth. The truth is preaching your mail. I ain't did nothing to your mail. I'm just preaching the truth. And it, oh, oh, because the truth does what? And it also hurts. When your wife finally tell you after all these years when you used to roll over with your morning breath and kiss her and on the 15 years she says, I can't take it no more. Please stop kissing me in the morning. Go brush them gold bricks. Wash that bacteria tongue that you snored with all night long and got dry heat on it. Brush your teeth and then come back and kiss me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now that hurts. Oh my God, you mean stinky lady. I hate your guts. How could you tell me that after all these years? See, y'all scared to say it. But I'll say it in a minute. I'll tell my wife her breath stink in a minute. I tell the truth about our relationship. Oh, so y'all still hiding, huh? Scared women and men. Tell the truth. It'll set you both free. You watch him get up and brush that teeth every morning. It's okay to say the truth. Say it in love. Conforming to the image of Christ. First Philippians 1 and 11 says this. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this 
will bring much glory and praise to God. God gave us a new life, and in that new life, he gave us new nature. And I looked up the word nature, and it says inherent character. And when we started this series, we were talking about how God's glory is best seen in Christ. And it said that Christ had the inherent spirit of God. And the inherent character that we get through salvation, through this new life, it is this. It is existing and something as a permanent and essential characteristic and attribute. So the same inherent character that Christ possessed for God, Christ gives us his inherent character so that we can possess the same character that he possessed in his attributes to God. So we follow suit. We follow suit in order that the second covenant was given. Nobody comes through God without Christ. I love how God is always a God of order. He's not a God of confusion. He's not a God of chaos. He has rank and file, and everything that he meant to do, he does. And when he established the second covenant, he said that nobody would come through me without going through my son to receive this gift. That would allow them to have what? True covenant with me. True relationship with me. That means you can be candid and frank with God and God can be candid and frank with you. You can tell God, God, I got a problem with that. Christ did it. Moses did it. Elijah did it. All the great men and women of God did it. But at the end of the day, what did they all say? Not my will, Father but your will. That's relationship. That's relationship. Relationship allows you to have a building character, a building relationship, a building conversation, a building communication with God through Jesus. Amen? Now, for the rest of our lives on earth, God wants us to continue the process of changing our character. Amen? You know, it's a constant process, guys. Yeah, I'm a relationship pastor because it's the hardest thing to have with God. An authentic relationship means that God's going to be brutally honest with you. But before God does that, he tells us to judge ourselves so no one can judge us. You have to be brutally honest with yourself about your true relationship with God. Listen, you know when you fake in the funk. It's kind of like the situation the church is in today. People don't want to give to support the church. But yet they say they have relationship with God. Well, if you have relationship with God, God tells you to support your church that you attend to. But that's just one part of the truth of the whole relationship. That's just one area. And then there's love your enemies, and then there's do unto others as you have them do for you, and then there's be a good moral person, and then there's not telling lies no more, not stealing no more, not coveting your neighbor no more, not having jealousy, not having it. You see, it's just a kick, 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 But it's all relationship. And God is so patient that he'll deal with one insecurity, one inferiority that you have at a time. He don't try to just change you all and everything. He says old things begin to pass away. And so those things, as we conform to the image of Christ, they just begin to become not important no more. It's not important for you to have the last word in the argument no more. Wow, when you can stop doing that, man, you have grown. And let me tell you who tests you with that. Your own kids. But I'm the father. You know, forget it. I ain't wasting my time no more. I don't need to have the last word no more. I said what I said, and it's over, and I move on. That's called me growing and maturing in my relationship with you. You know, as husband and wives, we always think we got to have the last word. Why do we always want to dominate one another with our way? Even though it bothers you, when are you going to get to that point where you just don't let it bother you no more? That's where I'm at in my relationship with Flo. Before I, why you do that? Why? She already told me a bunch of times why she does it. And you know what she told me? I don't know. <laughs> I learned so much from that statement. 
And so what I started doing is as I grow in this relationship, I realized this is who this woman is, and I can't change her. I now have to choose the high road and accept who she is. So I'm going to love her anyway. Ooh, guess what I did? I just grew in my relationship. I just matured. Oh, hear me, church. This should be a marriage sermon right now. In our relationship, the same thing with God. We mature. We're no longer drinking milk. We now on solid meat. And those things that used to bother us no more don't bother us no more because we are conforming. I'm sorry. I can't even get to this service. Stand up. But you know what? God always saves the best for last. It has to do with what I'm struggling with. And it talks about our struggles as we serve God. You know, when we overcome our situations... While we're serving God, do you know that brings glory to God? When we stay the course, no matter how hard the road is, when we have faith in God about a miracle he's about to do to keep our doors open, do you know that brings glory to God? I got the scripture for all that. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, saints, we're going to be all right. So, Father, I thank you for the day and... I just thank you for the word today and God I know I was in character today and I just hope that the funny parts was good and the good part was even better and so father let us retain what we can from the image of Christ and how when we are conforming father and I love how when we are transforming when we are converting when we are continuing the process of becoming the image of Christ you are glorified because you get excited. Oh, hallelujah. You get excited when we honor covenant. You get excited to see spiritual maturity. You get excited when we're learning about you, Father. You're so proud of us in those moments. And I know we have a lot of moments where you're not so proud, but you... Your love endures forever, so you can never not love us. But there's days that you're disappointed. But Father, I thank you that your anger only lasts for a minute, the Bible says. So God, help us. Help us to do our part in your kingdom. Help us to do our part in covenant, Father. Help us to grow in you, to understand you far beyond our understanding in ways that we've never known before, Father. Father, I see you so big that I want to open our eyes to see the limitless opportunity that we have in you. So God, I pray for place of purpose. I pray for our finances. Father, we're not asking for anything above our needs. We're just asking you to meet our needs because you said that you'll supply our needs. So, Father, you are Jehovah Jireh. As long as you meet the needs somehow, some way, Father, we will press on and press through. In Jesus' name, amen.